app as well, but I'll go through um, the app and the website later on. Um, so this just shows a quick view of the records that are in bird track. Um, the squares on the top map, um, the darker they are, the more records they have. And once you zoom in, you can start seeing more and more records. Um, so some of those are for the different colored pins are basically showing whether it's a common species, a locally rare species or a nationally rare, um, or what we call a threshold break, which is like an out season record um, or a high count, etc. cetera. Um, so you can see quite um, vast portions of the country are covered by bird track. Um, there's a few areas like upland areas, as with other projects that are less well covered. Um, but or what I'll go on to now is the type of records that you can um, put into bird track. So there's two main list types. There's casual records and complete lists. So casual records, uh, we tend to use that term. You might have heard of roving records as well, but they've all been kind of amalgamated into one to just call a casual record. And these represent the highlights of like your bird and visit. So it might be a rare or scarce species that you see while you're out, um, a high count, first of the year or an out of season record. Um, and me, for me, that was how I started my bird track journey. Before I even joined um, the BTO in bird track, those records that went into bird track were very much um, highlights. And even when you look back through my old notebooks, they're all highlights in there and there's, several species that never got recorded. Um, when I actually joined Bird Track um, as the organizer, I uploaded all my historical records and I was one species short and I couldn't work out what it was and it was coot. I've never recorded coot in a notebook because it was never a species that was, you know, wasn't scarce or rare. I never saw particularly high counts of them. They weren't at first of the year because they're always there and so, so, so on and so on, but yeah, Coot was one that never made it onto my records. On the other side of it, you've got complete lists. Now, complete lists is where you record everything that you positively identify whilst out by sight or sound. And moving on from that, so what does that actually give us? So casual records basically tell us what is there, but that's all. It doesn't tell you um, how long you're out, what other species um, were there, and what effort you put in. When you look at complete lists, you've got the species that you did see, but also because we know that you're saying that you recorded everything that you positively identified while you're out, we can also make assumptions of what you didn't see. So we can say, well, they went to this habitat and we know from that that they didn't see a willow warbler, for example. Whereas if you're doing a casual record, we don't know that because you haven't told us that you've recorded um, everything that you've actually seen or heard and also effort information so if you add a start and an end time to your visits we can then analyze those and see how long you were there and we can start to see you know if you're doing several complete lists over a period of time we can start to see the frequency of how each species occurs within those lists so if you did a really long list of say two or three hours um, and you just wrote willow warbler in there once. Um, if you did four complete lists of half an hour or three quarters of an hour, and you saw it every time in those lists, we'd know that they're, you know there's a good chance that they're there um, and in quite good numbers because you're recording them all the time. So, what um, another difference is casual records. We're really good at sort of work um, putting in our first sightings of the year. So as I said earlier on, casual records, you know, most people they'll put in the first of the year. And here's a couple of examples with Sam Martin and um, Swift. So we we'll, we we'll like to see our first Sam Martin swallows, Swift, shift shafts or whatever. And as birders, we're really, really good at recording those. But what we're really bad at is actually saying later on in the year that I'm still seeing them. And also, we're bad at actually, well, it's very difficult to know that that swift that you've just seen in late August was in fact your last swift of the year. So what this um, graph shows, both for Sam Martin at the top and the swift at the bottom, is by adding, um, by doing complete lists, because you're recording throughout the year and you're 
constantly recording what you are seeing, this then gives us a better timing of all the migration for certain species. So especially for summer and winter migrants, we can start to see when they arrive, and more importantly, when they're departing as well. Whereas the casual records, as you can see from, from the San Martin here, we're good at finding out when they first come, but we're really bad at actually um, saying when they actually leave. And you can see from up here where the complete lists are, the period that they're actually recorded is a lot longer than what it is when you're looking at just casual records. We can also do um, some phenology analysis. So here's a, what, one of our report and rate graphs. You might have seen these on social media and in other places. And this one's for um, chiff chaffs in Britain and Ireland. So this, this uh, red line at the back is the historical average. So that's taken over about eight years of worth of data. And this shows um, the percentage of completeness where people have recorded chiff chaff. So you can see at the start of the year, you got a relatively low number because we have a sort of winter and population. And then by mid to early March, they're starting to increase. And then by late March, there's a real boom of birds migrating into the UK. They start singing, etc. And then detectability goes down a bit because birds will stop singing because they've set up a territory. Uh, and then they get, like, go quiet through um, the summer months. And then you get a flush of autumn migrants coming back through and you get another peak here. This isn't the um, COVID-19 graph that you've all probably been used to. <laughs> um, it does show the peaks as well. And the green line is actually um, the records of Chiff Chaff in 2018. And if you can remember back, 2018 was actually the year of the Beast of the East. And we had quite a bad cold spell at the end of February and into March. And as a result, this curtailed spring migration somewhat and birds were about a week to two weeks late. And you can see that they came in uh, about two weeks later here and still sort of followed a rough trend of um, historical, but slightly lower than, uh, than normal. And you can actually overlay some of these years together. So you, the 2016 one was actually a warmer month, a uh, warmer year, sorry, and warmer spring. And the graph is about a week early compared to the historical average. So if you compare 2016 and 2018, there's almost a two to three week difference um, of the arrivals of Chiff Chaff. And that's purely down to the conditions in the UK and on their migration routes. So where does your data go when you actually add it to bird track? Well, it's not just a one way system. You can look at your own records, but there are a lot of um, ways that the bird track data that you enter is used. So for the Bird Atlas in 2017, uh, 2007 to 2011, about um, 4.5 million records from bird track actually went into the data that was used in the Bird Atlas. And um, if I go back, for one of these, um, Snow Bunton, a lot of the inland records actually came from bird track data. Um, where people were going out and about and just recording them as part of complete lists and casual lists. It's also been used in the European Breed and Bird Atlas. I think this is almost nearing completion and ready for publication. So this is the second Breed and Bird Atlas that they produced. And uh, all the data from the UK has come from um, bird track and that's fed into that um, over the, the period of the Bird Atlas. At a more local level, probably around about 75% of the um, bird reports that are produced use bird track data. Uh, so there's a, about 100, and just over 100 um, counties produce bird reports on an annual basis. And as I say, about 70% of those are using bird track. And it's actually starting to increase a little bit year on year as well, um, as some of the older systems fall, fall away. Um, but me, as a, I used to be a count recorder up for about 11 years for Suffolk and I know that a vast amount of the data that we use within that came from um, bird track and a lot of users that used to submit data directly to me through various spreadsheets or handwritten notes they switched to using bird track as well because they just know that it's easy for us to ex do one big extraction and take all the data out. It's also used by the rare breeding bird panel so on the right hand side you can see um, the paper that they produce in um, 
BB each year, British birds, and the data that's fed from bird tracks to the counting recorders is then filtered by the counting recorders, verified and checked, and then passed on to the rare breeding bird panel. And this is used to um, work out the populations of a lot of the rare and scarce breeding birds within the UK. There's also the Eurobird portal. So bird tracks not unique. There are several other what we call portals across Europe. So they're all doing the same sort of things. There, there's a hub where people can send their data in. So like bird track, there's also track Tellen and Ornitho for some of the other European countries. And basically all of those portals then feed their data into the European bird portal. And this allows you to map movements of uh, 100, about 105 species across Europe. So that's both summer visitors and winter visitors. And if you go on the Euro Bird Portal um, website, you can see some animated maps um, that show the occurrence of species. So for this one, we've got yellow-browed warblers in late or early September. So you can actually start to see if you, oh, I can't do it here, but if we press play, you'd actually see a suite of uh, a load of records up here in Scandinavia and then later on through the year as you progress through they move down into um, England and Scotland and Wales and move out and then sort of disappear off down south we're still not entirely sure where they're all wintering but it's a really good way of sort of tracking the migration of certain species and you can do it the other way as well so at the moment, if you go on and look at cuckoos, you can start seeing the cuckoos moving up through the Iberian Peninsula, up and through Spain and France, and the first ones are starting to appear in the UK at the moment. So that's pretty much bird track as it is. Um, I'll pass it over to Nick now, and he can do a little bit on um, the difference between bird track and GBW, or if there's any other questions that you want to ask, ask him, then we can answer them now. I think you're muted, Nick. I am, yeah. Normal, normally it tells you that you're being stupid. Yeah, I've just had a message flash up on the screen saying that saying that I'm muted. So um, that was brilliant. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's given us a really good overview of bird track. Like I said at the beginning, bird track is one of the two main things that we, the BTO, are encouraging people to use at the moment whilst the restrictions are in place. And the reason for that is you don't have to go anywhere. You can record birds from your own home, from your from your garden, or indeed on your on your daily exercise if you're out and about. Um, the other big or the other main scheme that BTO runs that that also focuses on gardens is the aptly named Garden Bird Watch. And one of the questions we get asked quite a lot is what what's the difference between the two? Should I be putting my records into Bird Track or into Garden Bird Watch? How, how do they how do they differ? So I'm just going to say a, li a little bit about that. Um, so the first thing to say is that the data both live in the same place. So we have one big one big Oracle database now with over 200 million bird records. I think it's got in it, and the, the Garden Bird Watch and the Bird Track data are all in there. So they're all they're they're both available. Both sets of data are available for um, conservation and for research and so on. But there are some there are some uh, differences to be aware of. So with Garden Bird Watch, it's about the species that are in your garden or using the resources of your garden. So it's focusing on birds in the garden. So the the dunnock on the lawn, uh, the house martin swooping in to take insects or to nest under your eaves that would count. But not the distant buzzard that you can see from your garden that isn't really uh, isn't really in your garden or using the garden. So GBW is focusing on the garden, and, and that means it can help us answer particular questions about garden ecology. Gardens are really important. They're becoming increasingly important as our landscape becomes more urbanised. And that's why we, we have that scheme, particularly focusing on garden birds, because we're really keen to understand what's, what's happening uh, to them. The actual recording is a little bit different. With Garden Bird Watch, you do a weekly maximum count of each species. So with Bird Track, whilst you're doing it, you do a if you're doing a complete list or a casual record, you've got a species or a set of species and a date. 
with Garden Birdwatch, the, the records are associated with a week rather than a single day. So that's a bit different. And also there's a, uh, a bit more structure to it. So you, you're encouraged to do, sorry, I've just, <laughs> just got distracted by, uh, it was actually a curlew, not a wimble, just flew past my window, but I, I did have to double check, sorry about that. Um, live, live birding. Um, the Garden Bird Watch has a, a structure, a bit more structure to it than bird track in that you're encouraged to do to be consistent so either 10 minutes every morning same time or one hour a week at the same time of, of day each week for garden bird watch whereas bird track it's any time any place that you're out birding so that's another key difference um in the past garden bird watch has been our one and only subscription survey so it was 17 pounds a year and that bought you uh a quarterly magazine called Bird Table and a team of people at BTO headquarters looking after looking after surveyors. Since the restrictions came uh, came into place, the Garden Birdwatch team have been able to make GBW free because they're keen to because it's the one of the few things people can do. They want to make as uh, many people make it available to as many people as possible. So for a limited time only, you can actually get involved in GBW for nothing. One last thing to say about GBW and BirdTrack is both of them allow you to record other taxa. So BirdTrack in the UK, you can record um, mammals and dragonflies. I'm just looking at Scott in case there's anything else that I know he's nodding. And we have got some uh, plans to add some other ones, but that's very, very early plans. So you're probably looking at least six months before anything with, else. And with Garden Bird Watch, you can record um, a whole range of tax. So there's there's a tab for bumblebees, for dragonflies, butterflies, um, mammals. So uh, many different species that are using garden habitats. So that's just a um, a quick overview. Um, I'm going to hand back to Scott now to give a sort of live demo bit of bird tra uh, about bird track. But if you've got any questions about anything we've said so far, stick them in the chat, and I'll get back to them straight away. I've seen one or two things just. Uh, just coming in now so I'll, I'll be addressing those in the chat whilst uh, whilst Scott shows you around uh, the bird track operational side. Right so hopefully you should all now see the bird track website. Um, so I don't want to go into too much detail about what actually is available in bird track because that will overwhelm you. Um, so basically what I'll show you is once you've signed up for BirdTrack and you log in, the first thing you'll see is the home page. Uh, just get rid of that. So there's a few things that are on here. I'll just quickly whip round. So there's a new patch widget, which basically shows you the number of species that you've seen um, at a particular location. You can change the location by just clicking on the name um, and then you'll get a list of all the places that you've got uh, that you've ever created in bird track and you can change it to those um, but basically it shows you a graph across the year um, the the outline tells you this number of species that you've um, ever recorded in that particular month and the sort of solid line tells you how many you've, you've recorded this year um, for the month and then at the top you've got so species 34 this month 36 ever um, and 74, 74 in the total of the um, for, for that patch. Below that is a an activity widget. So this basically just tells you when you went somewhere, where you went, um, what type of list or record you made, um, and the highlights. And these are ranked by scarcity and um, high counts, etc. And there's a little map of where you've been as well. You've got the report and rate graph, which is similar to which what I showed you in the presentation, and then a recent sightings map, and you can sort of zoom in and start to see some recent sightings, and then clicking on those will bring you up a list of what's been seen, etc. And you can do a search for um, all records, notable records, or you can search by particular species if you wish to. Um, just moving up, you've got a my species and lists thing which uh, this shows you similar to the patch one, but this is for all of your records. So you can see this year I've seen 151 species and I've seen 72 of those this month. And if I hover over, I saw 119 in January, 
83 in February, 103 in March and so on and so on. Um, you can change a few things so you can change the country that you're in or you can look at all your records globally if you wanted to um, and that just works on the current year. Below that you've got uh, a bird track calendar it just shows you the day, current day in blue and then days that you did casual lists in purple and then days you did complete lists in black and clicking on any of those will actually take you to that list that you made so you can look at it. And there's also below that a targets widget which basically shows you the species that have most been frequently been recorded by other people that you haven't recorded yet. Um, so you can see raven, willow tit and tree sparrow are my top three. And below that the species are, I've personally recorded the most are herring girl, wood pigeon and carrion crow this year and just shows you the number of records that you've made. So that's just a quick overview of the home page. Then on the left hand side, you've got a suite of menus. And I know, uh, Nick, you were talking about um, historical records, um, which at this particular time is quite good with people in lockdown. If you've got records sitting in a notebook, um, you can actually download a Excel spreadsheet and up, put your records from your notebook into that Excel spreadsheet. And then you can upload your records via the upload records page. Um, so you just choose the file you want to upload so you've your completed Excel document and then just click next and that takes you through a few steps of adding some records so that's a really good thing to be doing um, if you've got a load of historical records but what I really wanted to show you was what would happen if you come into bird track for the very first time and you want to start adding your own records so the first thing you do would go to add records and this is a two-stage process so the first page here is sort of all about the visit. So it's saying, where did you visit? When did you visit? And what sort of records did you, did you collect? Now, if we assume that you've just come into bird track, you won't actually have made, created any places yet. So this option won't really be of much use to you because you won't have any places set up. So we'll go to at a new place. What this does is it'll open up a map um, and you can go full screen on that map if it, if it helps. Um, or go back. And basically the easiest thing to do is to zoom in on where you live. So let's say we live in here. So you can just zoom in on the map. And then if you click on point here, you can say, well, that's my house there. So you can just drop the point in and then just give it a name. So in this case, we'll call it Churchfield. Um, and then we'll just give it a name of the local town as well that we want no, slightly wrong try not to use anything like my garden local patch dog walk or anything like that because it's a bit meaningless to anyone that wants to extract any data so you, you can also switch views as well so you can go to a street view or a os map if that helps you um, but once you've done that once you've created and named your site so using the point and then fill in the name. You can then progress down and just say when you visited. So you can say, so visit today, uh, and you can add start and end times. These are really, really helpful for us if um, when it comes to analyzing effort. You don't have to do it, but it is nice if you do it. So you can say, okay, I went out, looked in my garden from eight o'clock this morning, and I've stayed out there till half past eight. So just fill those in and then it's final question is what sort of records did you collect so in the presentation I told you there was two main types casuals and complete lists so the casuals is where you made um, just the highlights and then the complete list is where you recorded everything so if we go for a complete list here we'll then click continue So this second page is where you can actually start to enter the species that you recorded. There's two ways of doing it. The default view is the view that you can see here. So you just simply start typing in the species picker and you'll get a list of species. Now you'll see that there's some different colors on here. Now the, f the first ones are the most likely ones that you're gonna that match what you've um, started to type in. So that 
The most likely species is house sparrow because that's recorded more often than the one below, which is house martin. But then as you see, as you go down, there are a lot more options of other species that have the word house in or whatever you've typed in. Now, because bird track is global, this will present a list of the full 10,000 odd species um, that are in the IOC database. Um, and of, of those, how many have the word house in it? Um, so it does allow you to record absolutely everything. So if there's an escaped bird that you see, you can still type it in and you'll be able to find it. But they're just grayed out just to try and detract, um, try and stop you from picking something that's a bit odd um, and not expected. But just because they're grayed out, it doesn't mean you can't pick them. But the most likely species will always be at the top. So you can just click on that and then click add. And then you can just add in account. Now you don't have to add account if you see there's a presence tick here. So the fact that I've added house sparrow has automatically ticked this box. And you could leave it at that. And it just basically says, yes, there was some house sparrows where I was. But with everything else, the more information you can give us, the better. So you can add an account if you want. So you could say 10 or 12 in this case, sorry, 12. Um, or if you want to add an estimate, you can say, well, there was 12 plus, or you can even say circa 12. So if you're getting a flock of wood pigeons go over, you can say, oh, oh there's about 150 in there. So you can do circa 150. If you get an, um, you uh, say some house sparrows coming onto your feed, as you can say, well, there was at least 10 there, but I think there might have been more. You can do 10 plus or whatever. So once you've added that species, you can then go in and add the next species. So we'll do Stalin, and we'll just add that. Um, the other way you can do it is what's called checklist mode. Um, now this won't work for this site because I've just created it. But if you have a site, um, well, once you've done this, you'll, this will be added to your site list. So once you go back in against that site, BirdTrack will remember what species you've had before. And when you go to checklist mode, you will actually get a whole list of the species that you've already recorded there. So you can quickly go through and go, oh, wood pigeon. Yeah, I had wood pigeon. And you can add the count if you want. Didn't have a carrying crow. Yep, I had blue tit, had two of those. Uh, blackbird, yep, I had three of those. And that's a, just a quick, easy way of going through. And sometimes if I've been out, um, and I'll go come on to this later, if I've been out and used the app, I sometimes go back in and edit a record, uh, a visit, and just switch to checklist mode sometimes because that will sometimes highlight a species that I forgot to add while I was out. So Dunnock, Robins, Wrens, other species that you tend to overlook sometimes when you're doing a complete list. So it's just a bit of a nice way of just checking back. So those are the two, version, two ways that you can add, add your records in. You can also add um, breeding events as well. So at this time of year, if you've got uh, a pair of sort of in suitable habitat, or you can start seeing that they're, um, you know, taking nesting material in, um, or they're some recently fledged young, you can add that in as well. And if you click on the plus button next to each record, you can add even more details. So you can add free format comments. So you can say, um, you know, say you've got uh, one of the blackbirds had some white pigmentation in it. You can write white feathering, on head for example um, or if it's a notable observation so if you had um, say I got a nut hatch in my garden that would be extremely rare for my garden but it wouldn't be notable from a county point of view I can still mark that as remarkable but also you can mark records as sensitive as well and this is important um, for a lot of users where they come across um, a species that they don't want other people to be aware of, then you can mark it as sensitive. It is worth noting that a lot of species that you would typically think of as being sensitive are already hidden within bird track at certain times of the year. So species like red kites, peregrine falcons, um, little egret spoonbills, anything like that, mainly during the breeding season, if if you enter a record, it will automatically be marked sensitive, and that way it won't show on any of the public outputs 
Um, so like the uh, recent sightings graph I, uh, map I showed you on the first page, your record of that species won't appear in there. It will still be available to you and the county recorders, but no one else will see it. Um, and for those species, that if you're not sure whether it's come, going to be marked as sensitive, it's worth just checking that. Um, I always think, so if you found a roost in long-eared owl sometimes and you know it's close to a footpath and it might get disturbed by photographers or dog walkers or someone else, um, and you just want to you know, hide that record, just mark it as sensitive. Some of the other things you can do is habitats. You can add some information about what habitat it was in, what direction it was flying. So if you do a lot of sea watching or um, you, you know, seeing what birds like at the moment, you're in lockdown, what way birds are flying, you can put a number in so you can say, well, one of them flew off north northeast and two of them flew off south. Um, and you can add that information in. Pinpoint, this is more for if you're out and about so if you come across a singer nightingale on one of your walks or whatever, you can actually um, go in and show, show the map. So this will show an actual map of the site that you've got and you can actually double click and it will actually come up with a grid reference, a uh, six figure grid reference of where you were and you can add um, some details in there. So you can sort of and say, um, like here you can put nest site. So that just adds a little bit of extra information to the to the um, details that you're putting in. And again, breeding evidence, you can go down even further. So if you had, um, you know, you've got two pairs of blackbirds in the garden, one was some recently fledged young, and you've got just one single male, you can add that in as well. Um, extras, you can add in what sort of activity it was doing whether it's sick or injured or dead or um, crash size. So for things like shell duck, if you do that, you can add in the crash sizes that you see. Because we'd prefer um, that you don't pull, put in those in the total number. So if you see a, a pair of shell duck with 24 young, you don't put 26 shell duck in, you just put two shell duck and then put a crash size of 24 in. Um, so that's some extra inf more information. Plumage, so this is good for um, certain species that have different plumages so gulls um, they'll go through uh, different age classes as well and you have phases as well and these will only show for the certain species that you're uh, picking that you've entered so for blackbird you won't get any phases you'll just get breeding the number breeding plumage but if you did something like an arctic skewer you'd get dark phase light phase or pale phase or whatever in there so you can um, start counting those as well you can upload a photo if you wish and you can add another observer's name in so if you're putting the records in um, for for like a local club or whatever you can add the observer's name in there so once you've done all that you just simply click submit uh, it comes up as i've made one of those as a notable observation and then just gives you a brief summary and then you can just press home and that's all your records put in um, so that's pretty much how you set up a new site and add your first records um i don't know if we nick do you want to progress on to doing the webs uh the app or do you want to do any questions or anything on that um i think probably move straight on to the to the app i'm busy uh yeah. typing away in the background answering questions through chat so a few things have come up but i think, I think we've got most of those so yeah if you go straight on to showing people the smartphone app yeah um, okay. one of the things to touch on scott it might be worth just mentioning about um registering for for bto online uh, systems full stop and you know people who've already got accounts and that just to quickly touch on that would be great yeah. so if you've got a existing bto account you can log into your bto account via my bto and if you're not signed up for bird track you can then scroll down the page and i think it's surveys requiring for, sign up for surveys i think it's called um and then you can just pick bird track from that and it just guides you through a short process of setting up your username and password. And then once you've done that, you can then use those details um, on the entry page um, that I was at the start. Um, if you haven't got a BirdTrack account, you can you need to sign up for the 
BTO account first and then go back in and sign up for BirdTrack that way. I think if you've got a GBW account, you are, you're already a member as well, aren't you? Through, Bird, through BTO, I think. Nick? Uh, say that again, I was busy. You've got a GBW a account, you're, you've already got a BTO account, haven't you? I don't think they're kept separately. Yeah, so that's you, right. You just need to sign up for bird track, as in um, surveys requiring um, sign up for surveys. Yeah, so key things are if you've got an online account for any BTO led scheme, use that you should use the same details for all the schemes so that you don't have to remember a different username and a different password for bird track versus garden bird watch versus webs or anything else. Um, and somebody's just asked on the chat, I might as well answer this now, which is, do you have to be a paid up member of BTO? And the answer is no, not at all. Um, you're very welcome to take part in any of the schemes or surveys um, without being a member of the BTO. Of course, we welcome your support as members too, but you don't need to be to, to get involved. Yeah. Okay, so I will just quickly share my screen. Um, so uh, you should now all be able to see the app. So I'm just quickly going to guide you through how you would set up a site within the app. Um, this is the iOS version. Um, it's not too dissimilar in the Android version. It is slow. It is different, but not too dissimilar. So hopefully we can uh, be able to show you how to create your site. And I'll also show you how to add your records. So once you've logged in, to the BirdTrack app, so you've downloaded it, you've used your um, username and password that you've set up via the website, you can then log in, and this is the first page that you'll see. So if you click the big Add Records button, you'll then get this Visits page. Now, for most of you, if you've never, if you've got no sites or anything um, created and it's the first time you've used the app, this will actually be blank, it won't actually say anything. What the app has done here is it's actually um, looked at where I am physically with my phone and it's made an assumption that the site I'm going to use the records against is this site, which is my home. So it's saying, I think you're at St Edmunds Close Woodbridge, so I'm going to guess that's where you are and we'll also fill that in. For those of you that haven't got anything, that would just be empty. So what you need to do is just click on place. Um, and then create because you won't have any places now as long as you've got your um the wi-fi turned on and um the map shown you'll then get a map that's like this you won't have any of the red dots on because you won't have any sites but you should get this little blue um glowing icon down the bottom if you start zooming in on on that you'll actually get to where your location is so if you're happy with where the location is picked, you can then re actually name your place. So it's come up, come up with five Warren Hill Road, Woodbridge. So it's assuming that's where I am. That's not totally correct, but I can say, say I did live at Warren Hill Road. I can just take out the five if I wanted to. And that just gives me the name of the site that I want to use. You can totally take that out if you want to. And change it to whatever you want you just uh, click on and then delete and then you can just type in um, St Edmunds close and then the town there we go oh, it's auto corrected at the start so you can just add that and that will fill it in and then you've got similar things to what you've got on the website. So you've got the date, so you can click on that and change the date if you want to. Um, you can add a start time. Uh, end time, you can only do once you've selected the start time. So if we just say we started at 2.30, done, and we'll, we'll come back and do the end time later on. But then you've got the option to say whether you've done a casual or complete list. It's by default it's set at casual because we'd rather have complete lists sent in as casual records than casual records sent in as complete lists. So if you're going to do a, 
complete this, just tap on the complete and it will change it. Um, and then you can add some weather details if you want and some comments. So you could say, I was burdened with, you know, John or whoever you want to uh, add in or any other comments like that. Then once you've set up your visit details, you click records and you get a page where you start to enter the, the actual species you, you've seen. So um, we can say, right, I've seen Stalin. So again, these are listed by um, likelihood. So from what you've typed in, so I've typed STAR. So the first species, the most likely species is going to be um, Stalin, second to that black red star, then red star. And then as you're going down the list, you're getting rarer and rarer and rarer. And then, uh, but you can, as soon as you see what you want to add, you just tap it. And then you can add account again. You don't have to, you can just simply click add. Um, or if you want to, you can add an actual number. So if we do house sparrow, so 10. And again, like in the, on the website, you can do um, approximates as well. So you can do circa 10 or plus 10 if you want. And then you just add those. You can just keep adding species as, as and when you see them. Um, say you saw, uh, so Stalin, sorry, Stalin. You saw one Stalin and then you've a couple more flying. You can either type in Stalin again and then say oh, another two flew in and that will add, add them together. Or you can use these um, plus and minus buttons here to tap. So another one flew in um, and do it like that. So using the plus and minus is quite good for adding individual records, um, you know, add individual birds. But if you're doing like a sea watch or something like that or um, visible migration and suddenly a flock of 150 red wing fly over you don't want to sit there and tap 150 times on that so you can just type in red wing 150 and that'll add it on to your total and if you've seen the species already um, in that visit it doesn't duplicate it so you won't get two lines of Stalin it'll always add them together so you can just keep on adding species so we can say blackbird, uh, so we've sort two of those, um, collared dove, um, collared dove, two of those, uh, rook. Just. And then once you've done, done all of those, um, you can go back and change the end time. So you just check the time and it will default to the nearest sort of 15 minutes to where you are and then done. And then um, once you've finished, click out of that and you'll have the, the visit actually a summary on your visits page. So it tells you where you went. So St. Edmund's Close tells you when you went, what time you started and then end time and how many species you saw. And once you're happy with that, you can just click upload and that'll upload that until it's complete and the visit's gone and that will now appear on your website. So that's pretty much it with those. I um, don't know if there's any other, anything else anybody wants to know about that? Um, that's pretty much the web, the app anyway. Um, good stuff. Thank Did you, there, Scott. Any questions yeah. you want me to answer on that? There's quite a few coming in through chat. I've been, yep. um, my fingers are getting quite warm now. <laughs> uh, so, but just to cheat a bit, I'm going to answer some of them verbally. I'll get you to answer some of them um, verbally. So, Tim was asking uh, if I forget to change the list type from compl uh, to complete from casual, can I go back and do that? So I said, yes, you can either do that. Um, yep. You can do that online after upload, but yep. if you, you can do it on the app if you haven't uploaded, but once you've uploaded, anything from the app it's then effectively cleared from the app so if you need yep. to make changes to it you log you go to the online website and yep. find it through my records and do the editing um barry asks uh is this to be used on the hoof um <laughs> very much so <laughs> exactly uh that's that funnily enough when, when we built the app we we the, the birders at bto and the design team felt that uh because i used i used to be involved in bird track up until a few years ago um and we were all about birding and being out in the field and, and adding your you know rather than writing everything down on bits of paper or in a notebook trying to 
capture it live uh, through an app and that's why we sort of developed the app but very quickly people started saying to us well I'm, I'm trying to add records from three weeks ago on the app and, and that was alien to us but in fact a lot of people actually like yeah. doing things on their phone first and uh, even if it's adding adding old data so we we've made quite a few things to make it so that you can do both you can use it in the field but you can also use it as shop scott was showing you can go back to previous dates and add old records through the app if you want to mm -hmm. yep uh what else is there um so, yeah entering records as you're walking yeah so i think it might be easier if i share my screen on to here to quickly show you this one so you there's different ways that you can create a site when you create a site by the website they are done as what we call points so it's literally just a pin in the map you can create them slightly differently as well um, there's also the path option or the polygon the point I tend to advise people is if I'm going to add um, casual records, I tend to use it as we used to use the roving records or casual records. So if I was driving along this road here and I spotted a barn owl here, I might add that location as a point purely because I'm not likely to return there. It's just a casual record and the point sort of marks where I saw it. The other two options I would tend to use if you're doing um, frequent or repeated visits there. So for a walk that you do all the time, or um, if that's a location you go bird watching with. So if we just concentrate on this map here, so a path, um, let's hope that there's, there is a path, so that's pretty good. So I've just switched to the OS map here, and then if I click on path, I can then, you see a little blue dot. If I click at the start, I can then drag and click again and just keep clicking. And it starts to create a path. So I can actually say, well, this is where I go on my dog walk or whatever in the morning. Uh, and that's it. Double click and you get this path. It doesn't have to meet back at the start if you don't want to. You can do just, um, if you want to, do like sections along a river um, you could just do um, like click along like that and then just double click when you finish and you'll get this this line um, but once you've done it just give it a name like you do so you could do uh, I don't know it most some paths have a particular name or you could say um, walk along walk uh, and then give it the name monks Any and save that or the other option that you've got which i tend to, um, nick will probably agree with this if you're going to a site so say this was an area here was a site that you actually had access to and you went burden here and you tended to wander around you didn't necessarily follow an exact path each time but you generally covered the same area the polygon is a really good tool for that and again you just click on the map to start doing and then each time you click, you can just move around and go around the edge of your site and then either come back to the beginning or double click. And then you see the shaded area is what you're actually saying is your site. And this really does narrow it down for um, counting recorders and anyone looking at the data you, on the records that you've put in. Because what you're essentially saying is my records came from within this area. Uh, and we can be fairly sure that all of your records come from there or were observed from there. So you don't have to say, well, set up a new site for um, over here. If you saw a buzzard, you can say, no, was, you're basically recording anything from that site. Um, so that the other two options that you can use. Um, um, you can edit anything. So say you'd created this site here in the app you can actually bring that back up and you can actually change it to one of these as well if you wanted to. Um, Scott, can you just briefly show how you find an existing an existing site that you might want to edit? Yep, so if I go back to the home page, so you've come back, um, you can click on My Places, 
you can then either search for it on the map by zooming in and out and finding it and clicking on it and then editing or if you know the name of the site you can do St Edmund's Close so I'll actually use this bottom one because that bottom one is the one that I created on the app um, if I get rid of my so you can then click edit on that and you can change it you, you can either move it if you wanted to by because it's on a point um, or you can click path and then change it to a path or for, or you could do it as a polygon so you can draw around exactly where you you are and you can rename it as well if you wanted to and just once you're done you click save is that okay Well, thanks, Scott. And then yep. another good question, uh, this time from Michael, which I'm going to fit, uh, pass to you, which is, is there a maximum recommended size for a site? Yeah, we tend to limit them to an area of around 5K at most. That's um, most of my sites, if I try and if I bring them up, um, if I back. loads uh my places so i've got one for the whole of woodbridge which is quite a big site so this is my hometown so i've got a pretty big one for that but you'll see a lot of the other ones are a little bit smaller than that and i've kind of sectioned them off some of them are just a, a 1k reference from any survey work i've done or there's some um bigger site. so it tends to be anything that you could sort of generally walk in within a within a day um and you know be quite consistent on your effort i wouldn't if you're a uh do a lot of walking um so if i bring up an os map and just hide my so uh we've got this long sandlands walk along here if if you knew you were going to do that in a whole day i don't necessarily think you should do that as a one line you might just break it up into sort of one kilometre stretches or maybe two kilometres at most. Um, but yeah, it's just try and keep them in, within a manageable area of what you generally cover when you're going out bird watching. Scott, can I, can I chip in briefly on that? Mm -hmm. Yep. The one thing that it's worth just mentioning to everybody is we, when we, when we set bird track up, well, before my time, um, we're really keen that it was, how how people bird watched and not structured like the breeding bird survey for example which sends you to a particular square and you have to walk uh, yep. transect uh, two parallel transects so within reason try and make it uh, something that's comfortable for you to use in the way that um in the way that you go bird watching so i'm like scott i've got lots of fairly small sites set up as polygons particularly close to home where i go do birding where i go birding a lot and i know what my nunnery lake site is i know in my you know when i'm there i know where the boundaries are and similarly when i go to some of the local nature other local nature reserves and then i've got some slightly bigger sites like parts of fetford which I wouldn't necessarily go for bird watching, but I, I may work because I'm there a lot. Um, I quite often see things there and I want to put them somewhere and I don't want to have a, a site for every street in Thetford, but I, I do want to be able to record that honey buzzard that drifts over on that special day, one, one June. Um, mm. So, so that's, that's uh, the way to think about it. But then, like Scott says, if it's getting really big, if it's a really long walk or something like that, you're probably not going to be bird watching the whole time anyway. So... Um, breaking it up into into shorter sections is is a good idea so try and think about it in terms of how you, how you bird watch um, Sarah asks uh, can you go through again how to put place in as uh, no location appears on the map uh, on the app that's a good point so um, are you are you ah. able to screen share on the app again Scott and run yep. through why uh, the, why the location might not ping up Yep, let me just, uh, there we go. So if you go to the settings page, you need to make sure that you've got this track my location and show maps enabled. Um, and then when you go into the location thing, so here, 
that should then show where you are. If this, if this bit here, if this name bit up here and the lat long are blank, it probably means that in your settings page, that and that are missing. Um, if you see, if I go back and I've turned them off, there's actually nothing, it won't come up with anything. Um, if I track my location, it comes up with a lat long, but no map. If I then click show maps, it then brings up a map as well. And you can switch between those as well, um, if you want to. And you can, if you, once you've got some place, lots of places, you can actually show and hide them as well. So as you can sort of declutter the map if, you, if you've got a lot of places. Um, is that okay? Yeah, that, that's great, Scott, thank you. Um, I've just said to everybody on the chat, but I'll repeat it here, which is that we've, we've overrun a bit. Um, so if you do need to go, you uh, please do, do head off. Um, similarly though, if you want to stay on and keep firing questions at us, uh, that's what we're here for. We're very happy to help. So uh, Jane asks, um, do different organizations share information? I just entered bird records in, uh, into iRecord as I was recording bee flies. Should I then put them into bird track or garden bird watch? Um, so the answer to that is we're, it's up to us, it's up to BTO to, to get the, the data sharing right. So at the moment we are putting our records from BirdTrack and other schemes at a 10K resolution, I believe, into um, the National Biodiversity Network, which I record also feeds into. So you don't need to be putting things into multiple places. If you're recording a certain taxa, whether it's bees or birds or anything else, in one place that works for you, don't feel that you have to then put it in another place. Um, thanks, Barry. Cheerio. Thank you, Barry. Um, so yeah, please don't feel like you've got to put things in multiple places. There's nothing worse than uh, having to ent enter data more than once. We, we're really against that. And it's up to us to make us as in the BTO and the other organizations in this sector to make sure that the data are, are going where they need to go and, and, and so on. So, so don't worry about that. Um, in there as well, Nick, that um, we are looking at a data share between ourselves and iRecord at the moment. Um, so yeah, I would, I use iRecord for my moth records, etc. cetera. Um, I don't put any of my bird records in there but we are working, <coughs> excuse me, on having a two-way flow at the moment with mammal records, Odonata, so damselflies and dragonflies, and bird records. We're looking at, at setting up this two-way flow that um, if I enter records in iRecord, they can be, but bird records in iRecord, they can be verified in BirdTrack and the other way around. So if I enter records in BirdTrack, someone can verify them in iRecord and they'll be available to the recorder, whoever uses iRecord. Um, they won't show side by side, as in your bird records won't show in iRecord that you entered in bird track, but they will be, you, the, the relevant people will be able to extract them, no problems. Um, so like the county recorders. I've probably overcomplicated that a bit. But. It's, well, it's a, it's a it's a complicated area, isn't it, Scott? I think you've I think you've um, I think you've answered that well. I think that's good. Um, there's a really uh, <laughs> there's the ultimate impossible question here from a chap called Nick Mariner. It says, "Can we have a couple of minutes demo on Explore My Records, please?" As it's really powerful, I can only do demos that last uh, three hours on Explore My Records because I've got. <laughs> 170,000 records in bird track and I just love going in and playing yeah, with yeah. them and pro producing graphs and all the rest of it but I'm sure Scott can do a more sensible sensible uh, one on that but before he does uh, Tim asks um, I've used bird track in a couple of other countries just checking that the information get, uh, does get to the national scheme for that country uh, to which I think the answer is yes yeah and um, similarly from Sarah I use eBird um, do they input data with yourselves as well <laughs> now this is the complicated one <laughs> um, so the simple answer is no uh, but we do have a really really good um, like working relationship with Cornell um, you know Nick um, did this job before I did and 
um, I think talk started when you were there about this data sharing. Um, it's still never been resolved. Um, we would really like to, but there's, as of anything, there's a whole heap of politics involved. Um, the actual concept itself in sharing data is dead easy relatively because we do it with the euro bird pool um, and um, other places that take our data um, so it's it is possible but there are a lot of complications that come in with who owns data etc etc and we need to address those first before we progress it um, it's worth adding that for um, countries in europe that have decided to use eBird as their primary bird recording platform. So we're talking about bird track in the UK, Republic of Ireland context, but some other, another, Scott mentioned other countries that have got their own platforms. Yeah. Some countries have chosen to use eBird in Europe and yeah. those, those countries eBird data feed into EuroBird portal and, and, their, and, a, and are the kind of national portal for that country. So it kind of depends a bit on the country, but we're, like with the other systems, like with iRecord and, and everything else, it's up to us to sort out the um, the data flow behind the scenes. But it is, yeah, each one comes with its own uh, with its own complexities. Yeah. Thanks, Caroline. Yep. Yeah. And thanks, Sarah, for that question. Go on. Are you going to launch into Explore My Records for anybody? Yeah, who's I, can, I can go into Explore My Records. Um, this is this is for the this is for the Uber geeks. Um, <laughs> what what we really love about the system uh, is that. Yeah, it's kind of power to you. The more you do in a local place, the, the more you get to know about it and then the more you want to do. And, you know, you're knowing exactly which week of the year so-and-so should be arriving or departing. But I'm not saying anymore. I'm muting myself. So that's... <laughs> oh, thanks, Nick. Um, so, yeah, when I before I came on board with BirdTrack, I almost thought BirdTrack was a one-way system where you literally put records in and county recorders or BTO done their magic uh, and took it out and produced bird reports and um, atlases, etc. But that's actually a whole suite of features in here that you can do yourself. So on the home page, you've got a couple of examples of that where you've got these, um, you know, graphs of showing how many species you recorded at a location over the year. Um, but you can actually go in and do more. So if we click on explore data and then explore my records, um, you get a whole page filled with uh, sort of search tabs or um, filters across the top that allow you to drill down in different uh, ways to the, to the records that you've put in. So the first of those is dates. So you can look at all your records, those for a particular year, a particular month, a date or a range of dates. Um, so here, if we've got 2020 um, place, so you can do the entire world you can do just a particular country so here i've just got the united kingdom or a place so this is where the geekiness of people like nick come in where they all want to look at their patch and they'll drill down and they'll find their local patch in here that they've added and they'll be able to do various outputs from that um, if i just click back to that and you can even do it down to a county level as well so you know some people are really um, keen on keeping a list of species that I've seen in their their county so you can drill down and just look at um, the records for that country uh, county sorry you can also just do it by species as well so if you wanted to know um, certain things about the blackbird records for your for your patch um, you can do that and you can also search by the particular taxa so as I said we don't just do birds we do do mammals and dragonflies and butterflies so you can filter those but what are the main outputs you can do so you can do like a table of um, your records so uh, this would if I go through one by one so at the moment I've got 2020 selected uh, for the UK and just birds so if I click a table and click create output this thing gives a quick summary uh, of the data that I've had for uh, records for 2020 so you can see I've had 151 species from 984 records, um, 24 complete lists, and I visited 41 places. And it gives you the number of records for each species, uh, the number of places you saw it, and the report and rate based on those, and the first date that you recorded it, and the first place that you've done it. You can 
sort that by um, it's in taxonomical order for me, so it's done it in reverse taxonomical order. Um, clicking on it again, puts it back into the taxonomical order by the IOC. And then you've got um, subspecies as shown as well. And I don't know if I've recorded it. Oh, here we have hybrid duck. So where it's got square brackets around it, it means it hasn't counted it as a um, in your list because it's not a, a, a legitimate species, as it were. So if I recorded the same for, say, uh, a peacock or whatever, that wouldn't count on my list total because it's not an actual countable species. But there you get a quick overview of sort of the number of species you've seen um, through the year. So what else can you do? You can do a graph of species accumulation. So select that from the output and click create output. And this shows you a graph over the year of the species that I've added. So at the start of the year, January the 1st, I went out and saw 49 species. And then as I progressed through the year, the number of species went up and up and up. Um, and this, if I just change it to last year and then update all tabs, it'll probably be better. So you'll be able to see where you've got a bit of spring migration here really does start to boost your numbers up over the course of a couple of months. And then it sort of tails off and then you get another little bit of a peak later on in October. Um, so that's really nice to have a look at. I'll just change it back to 2020. Um, what else you got? Species per year. So this one I'll need to change to um, all records. Um, and then I'll do create output. Uh, come on, just take a little bit of time to do these. So what this is showing is the number of species are recorded in bird track for all of the years that I've um, entered data. So you can see, this is where I added all my old notebooks. So there wasn't a whole lot of records I'd done in my early years. 1999, there's just one record, which is an ivory gull. Uh, someone, someone stole my 2006 notebook, uh, or maybe I misplaced it, but I think stolen is more likely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah I've just got nine but you can start to see how year on year um, the species varies especially if you looked at Nick's graph who's got a lot more historical data in there and has been using bird track a lot longer than I have a lot of these there wouldn't be so much of a fluctuation as I've got here but it's still just nice because I'm older than you Scott pardon it's just because I'm older than you yeah not not by much but we won't get um, so that's really neat. And again, you can do that if you want to do um, your world list or just wherever you, the countries you've visited um, or just a particular location. So if I do, uh, where are we? The patch I go to. Um, oh, sorry, update all tabs. That just takes a little bit of time just to update it. That will then give you the, the graph for the number of species you're seeing for that, that particular place over all the years that you've been going. Um, it's taking its time on here. Let's get rid of those two. There you go. So that's just from my, my patch, just shows you the number of species. And uh, yeah, for the likes of myself and Nick and patch watchers and even for gardens this is quite a neat little graph that you can do and shows sort of how, how one year compares to the next um, species per month so again you, I'll just use more patches this but you, again you can choose the country or you can choose uh, county um, this just shows you the, the way that the number of species changes over the year so when it comes on Seems to be a bit slow when I'm connected to doing this. Come that's on. that's the live demo effect, Scott. I know it is. <laughs> seems seems okay. to try and... Yeah. Yeah, so you've got a bit of a peak. This is this I have to admit, this is my patch because I tend it tends to be more of an autumn patch, which you can actually see from these these records, even though I I do tend to visit slightly more in the autumn, but I do go in the spring as well. You can see that um, even by going in the spring, the number of species I record is lower than later on in the year. 
Um, and I've always thought that of my patch and sort of I've now got the, the data to, to prove that, to show that my, my patch is more of a, uh, an autumn migrant trap than it is a summer or oh, spring migrant trap. So that's always neat to show. Um, peak counts per week. So this is a good one for, if I change it to all uh, United Kingdom and Blackbird. So peak counts. So you can see here how much Blackbirds are so much more evident in the, the, the autumn time than they are of the spring. So even though I'm recording blackbirds throughout the year, um, you do get a bit of a spike around here, which is probably to do with me being out um, and seeing a few more blackbirds when I'm out and birds leave in the UK probably. Um, the, the other end, you've got um, the peaks here. And I know, Nick, you've got a really good one for your patch and you can sort of almost um predict the week that you're going to get the peak number of blackbirds year on year it always seems to be around about i think week, it is similar to week, week, for, week 46 it's about a week later than it is on the coast I yeah think. Okay. um just to say scott um you've still got you've still got double figures with you which i'm quite impressed with but uh, a <laughs> fair, fair few people are going which is absolutely fine um thanks to everybody who's who's been on the uh, on the session, uh, the other thing is anything you've seen that of, that Scott's been showing in Explore My Records, um, you can you can easily download. So there's a I'm sorry if you've already mentioned this, Scott. I was busy in the chat, but the, there's three little hamburger uh, symbol on the top right of the graph yeah. um, where you can click and export. So anything nice that you've created and think, oh, I want to show so and so that, you can just download it as a as a jpeg or whatever and, and send yeah. it to somebody else and similarly when you're in the table if you've downloaded a tape uh, one of those summary tables like scott showed um you can download the contents of that table into an excel file um yeah. so i mean yeah. if it's those 305 blackbird records you you can't see much you, you can do graphs with them through the website but you can't see the individual records but if you click download, they come out in an Excel file and you can have even more hours of fun um, <laughs> mucking about with all your data. So that's, uh, that's worth, worth knowing. Yeah. Um, I've only got a few more to go through. To, uh, see, uh, as we're recording this, I might as well just carry on if you want. And those that if people want to stay, they can. If not, then we can just um, carry on recording and upload. Do you want to do that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So we've got the peak counts for week. So there's a quest yeah. question coming in. Okay. Nick, thank you. I've, I've been quietly listening for the last couple of hours, but I have to go now. But thank you so much. It's been really useful. Okay. Yeah. No, not at all. Nice to see you, Elaine. Thank you. Good to see you too. And take care. Thank Good, you. thanks. As a Bye. note, Bye. There, are, there are four videos on the Bead Show's um, YouTube channel that have got how to create a site, how to explore records, how to um, add records, and one other. La, 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 la. I think it's tour of the homepage. So if you want to refresh some of those, uh, you know, refreshing memory, they're on there as well. Um, but going back to to these, yeah, like Nick says, his peaks in week forty six, mine's in week forty seven. So uh, yeah, it's just interesting to see. The differences from site to site. Of course, I may have misremembered that because I haven't got mine. <laughs> I haven't got mine open in front of me because I didn't want to be sort of playing top trumps and going. I've got a. I've got a different graph. No, you'd always beat me. <laughs> You're always beat me. <laughs> too, too too many records. I could do a number of yellow bread records on my patch. And just yeah, see. I can tell you how many I've had on my patch. <laughs> um, so records records per month. Again, this is a good one. You can do either um, for a particular species or if you want to look at, so if we take out Blackbird here, um, if I get rid of some of these just to stop to speed things up a bit, um, create output. This sort of shows how active you are throughout the year in, a, in effect. Um, so you can see, as with most bird watchers, June and July is a bit of the doldrums. Um, uh, yeah, if I should put my Odonata records on there, that'd probably be the spike because where where your focus changes. But it's really neat to show, um, you know, how you the number of records 
changes across the year. So you can see in May I've done like 1,970 and then in June 679 um, records. And then it just goes back up in the autumn again. Um, and like I say, if you do, uh, Blackbird is always a nice little one, to, if you can type, spell it properly. So yeah, you can see the number of Blackbird records, you know, how I've recorded them over the year. So you can start really delving in. Um, again, records per year, that's, I tend to use that more for, for scarcity. So if we do do Yellow Braid Warbler, um, so you can see the records per year of Yellow Braid Warblers. So you've got sort of some years where I haven't got any, and then other years where we've got like 23 records. And that's not just individuals, that's actually number of records as well. Because um, I think that's the year I went, yeah, I went to Farrell that year and I think I had like 30 in a day sometimes. So yeah, it's just really nice, nice way of showing your records. And especially for maybe a species like Waxwing, where you get invasion years, you probably, um, you can sort of almost immediately see when the invasion years of waxwing are just by your own records because you can start to see what years you were always recording them in. Um, and the last record report rate by month. For, so for, all those, for all those sorts of things where you're looking at graphs of um, individual species, if you're doing it for a place that you go to consistently, then there won't be any uh, biases introduced by say, Going to going to Fair Isle one year and not the and not the next. So so if you're doing this, I, that's where I spend <laughs> most of my uh, most of my spare hours on bird track is is looking at my own patch because I because I know I go there uh, fairly consistently and therefore yeah the patterns are just uh, really really fun to look at and I know that there's less bias than if I looked at say uh, some of the nicer species that I might have gone out of my way to see. Um, but no, there's there's hours and hours of fun in here, as I think we demonstrated. <laughs> and yeah, this report rate by month is quite a neat one for for a place. So um, so th if we go back to my patch and do yellow bro warbler and create output, it's probably be well because it's a scarce species. It'll probably be wildly um, a lot of uh, we're going to do, yeah, so you can see <laughs> the report and rate is, you know, I get them in September and October and that's it. Um, and out of that, 17% of my my visits have got um, yellow brown warbler in. Um, whereas if you do, I'll try, uh, Jeff, Jeff. Definitely is on a go slow this morning and we're doing a demo. There you go. So, so are you, so are you, because it's four o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> not the, it's, not the, it's not the morning anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Too right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that just, you know, you can just drill down as much as you want. And last one was just the map. So this is, you might as well use Yellow Bro Warbler again. Um, I'll just get rid of these two off of there and then create a map. So that shows you all the locations in the, where I've had yellow browed warbler. Um, if you do the world and update it, it will then go global. Um, is it gonna, come on. Is it doing it? It should do it because I've had some, I think I've had some on the Canary Isles. No. Anyway, you can you can see you know it's good enough, so you can start zooming in and start seeing all the locations that you've had them. So yeah, twenty one yellow bright warblers on my patch. Um, and then you've got all the records up from Farrell as well. So three lots three lots of records up there. For all the maps, you can click that expand button as well, can't you? If you yeah. want to see the whole. You want to go to the whole. the screen. On the screen, you can. Yeah, and then you can do a street 
map as well. So, yeah, loads and loads of possibilities. So basically, for a combination of all of these uh, filters at the top and all the outputs, you can, you know, spend hours and hours and hours looking at all your records, mapping them, seeing when you've seen them, you know, what times of year, all sorts. So yeah, loads and loads you can do. So is there any questions from that, Nick, that we can answer? Uh, I think you've, you haven't quite nobbled everybody. There's still um, Martin and um, Tim and Jackie, I think, on the call. But most, most people have uh, said their farewells and thanks. Um, we haven't, I don't think we've had any questions for a few minutes that, that we haven't already covered. So I think we've, think we've probably hit, uh, nailed it there, Scott. Thank you. Okay, sorry it's gone over, but um, hopefully we've covered everything. And um, yeah, we've, if we make this available via YouTube or whatever, then um, those that have had to leave can come back and look at it and same yourselves if there's anything you're unsure of. It's not in a video, just ping me an email, um, scott.masonbto.org and I can get back to you. So thank you all for attending. Brilliant. Scott, thank you, Nick. Thank you on our behalf. Um, thanks for using species so local to us as well. That's brilliant. It's <laughs> great. Dream of a yellow brow warbler anyway. <laughs> but anyway, that's another thing. Um, thank you both for that. Um, really appreciate that. And we'll have a chat after about whether it's this video or the various YouTubes and get the right kind of sign facing. Yeah. No, great, brilliant. thank you.